Hello, everybody. We are back. It is another week of truth or skepticism. I'm Tom Sosnoff. He's still in Radigan. Dylan, the Fed just came out. I'm not sure exactly what they said. Probably nothing, but uh, S&P's rallied a little bit. It's Wednesday. It is May 1st, Labor Day in some parts of the world. And um, it is... It's Labor Day around the world. But everything, you know, we're ethnocentric here in America, so everything is all about us. You know how that works. Um, I understand. It's not Labor Day in Chicago, okay? It's Labor okay. Day everywhere else in the world. Um, and uh, S&P just rallied a little bit on whatever whatever the uh, Fed minutes. On the, on, the no, on the no move move. On the no move move. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, bonds, I'm sure are up, bonds are up a full point, which is kind of, that is the only thing I got right here. So I will give myself credit for that. One thing. Um, take it. Yeah, we'll take it. But other, and I'm sure Italy will have 5,000 words for us at 4 p.m. on overtime. So if you yes. really want to know about the Fed. Well, I figured free. the best play in the market was the bonds, and I actually was right for once. I didn't make any money on it, but I was right. Um, it's being right is more important. Being right? Oh, yeah, much more important. The psychological side is way more valuable. I, I've, been right, I've been right all year on oil. Haven't made a penny. Anyway, I was um, going back and forth with a couple of, uh, customers and people here about different topics for truth or skepticism. People get all fired up about this segment. And, um, and one person asked me, said, Tom, let's, can you cover tenure? I want to hear what Dylan Radigan has to say about it. And I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, well, we're not talking tenure notes. So um, I don't think we've ever had a discussion on the concept and, and there's so much going on right now around college campuses in the U S um, that I think it's actually a pretty interesting topic for this week. I don't think, I mean, the last time I can remember this kind of, um, of, of a student uprising would have to, I mean, don't we have to kind of go 68, back? 68. It's yeah. gotta be 60. You know, I mean, yeah. Early seventies. Um, you know, I was a product of the early '70s. A um, lot of well, imagine the pull because I guess I mean because '68 is the signature year, right? In terms of both college protests and yeah. the political conventions that summer. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the I mean, Democratic convention in Chicago in the yeah. summer of '68 is a is one of the, it's the only legendary political convention in modern American history for the protests, violence you know, hostility, controversy, et cetera. And yeah. it seems between by, by, between the campuses, Biden, Trump, this whole thing, like I think we got ourselves a little, uh, we're going to have a a hot summer. Well, also the, the Democratic Convention is back in Chicago this year, which is... Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Actually. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And okay. um, actually right by our office. Um, really? It's at the United Center and we're right down, literally right down the street. You can throw a stone from the United Center wow. where Tasty is. So, um, yeah, so um, so talk about coming full circle. And I don't, what year was Kent, what year was Kent State? Was that 68? I don't, I'd have to Google, no, it was later, because Kent State was the end. Kent State was like the, the Was it 72? I, I, I believe it, that or 71. But we'll find out, Quick, Google will tell us extremely quickly. Um, 1970. It was actually it was actually May fourth. It was this week in 1970. So mm -hmm. it was 50, 54 years ago. Um, now the video that I saw from NYPD at Columbia, the cops were appeared to be extremely well behaved under extremely difficult circumstances. Meaning that the students seemed to be very aggressive. And the cops seem to be very disciplined, which I took, I, I offer as a compliment to the NYPD at this point. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the reason I bring up what's going on in college campuses right now is not to have a discussion on that topic because I don't want to get, I don't want to go down, of course. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole for, you know, a financial network. But um, one of the reasons, one of the original um, reasons behind the whole concept of, of tenure for professors and teachers was 
to protect them from um, any kind of political um, political ideology they may have, political discussions they may have, um, thoughts that they might talk about, creativity, you know, just, just um, uh, it was really more of a protection, wasn't it? Originally, that was kind of the oh, whole For thing. sure. No, I mean, to this day, sort of in the abstract, tenure is a wonderfully aspirational concept that has in my been, you know, we'll talk about a litany of issues with it, but yeah, tenure existed or exists at its highest and best purpose to protect controversial thought, opinion, research, um, so that people are not afraid to lose their job if they decide to research if there's aliens or if they decide to research if there's not a God or do something that is sort of socially uh, yeah, or they cover a topic in a book that's controversial or that's been banned yeah. somewhere else. They read yeah. a book that says there's yeah. no God and you can't get fired for that. Yeah. Or they read a book that says the exactly. aliens are in charge. Yeah. So I'm not sure that we're going to be on different ends of the spectrum on this, but one of the things that I wanted to cover, because the way I wanted to relate this back to markets is that I'm, I'm trying to, and, and I haven't even been able to solve for this in my own head, whether tenure actually is in the, and I know there's lots of different debates that have been going on for years in some states like Florida don't even have tenure. Um, but, and I think there's four states, Florida, Wisconsin, and two other states, I can't remember which ones they are, that, that don't even have it. Um, but does it serve... Does it serve its purpose, as we just talked about, to protect, you know, that kind of um, freedom for for teachers, or does it really limit today's curriculum, and does it really restrict? Because there's because basically it's a in some ways it could be a disincentive. Cal- well, not only that, it calcifies the faculty such that no, there's no. Same thing. There is right. no, there's there's no new blood. There's no new thought. There's no new anything. It is a it is a calcif. It's a say. It's like these. It's like our presidential candidates. It, it's 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 day of the dead. Yeah, I mean, think about think about the the way college sports has evolved, and players can now. You know, used to be if you want. It used to be if you wanted to be at one. If you're at one university, you were limited from going to another university because you would have to sit out a year. And you lose a year of eligibility. But now anybody can enter into what they call a transfer portal, a portal, and then they can go to another university and be fully eligible. They don't lose any time, go anywhere they want, and everything's Which up I think grabs. is terrible. I think that's terrible, by the way, but that's a different decision. Well, okay, but would you feel the same way if that was – if professors could enter a transfer portal, a portal so that, so that if you were – like a really interesting professor and you wanted to switch schools, you could, which you can't really do today. Of, of course. Yes. But I mean, yes, I would like, and that. would, but I, would I, higher I, education be better for that? Higher education would be better if 80% of the universities were shut down completely. That and is the not best, the question. And the best professors from the remaining 20% of the universities were more broadly accessible to all of the students. That's what would make it better. That's ridiculous, though. That's not. Oh, and, I, and your transfer portal is okay. I mean, all yeah. these instances of. So, so can I? Can I? Can I offer a couple of points of context? Can I give? Can I just give you a little context? Sure. So when I was a host at MSNBC, there was I was offered this contract to write this book called Greedy Bastard. And so the book, Greedy Bastards, we put together this outline. We're like, oh, we'll look at all the major industrial sectors of the U.S. economy, with obviously the banking sector being the most important, and then trade, healthcare, energy, and education. And then I I set out to basically interview the best people I, I could find on each topic. New ideas to solve, to improve education, improve healthcare, improve energy efficiency, et cetera. And so in doing that, I discovered lots of really smart and interesting people in the educational world. 
And the question that I was asking was not about education, but it was about learning and how people learn. And I believe where whether it's the tenure discussion or the university discussion or the Florida curriculum or anybody's curriculum, the problem with every single one of these discussions is that they all revolve around what is in the interests of the teachers, professors, and administrators. That none of these things are done in the interest of the students learning things. So all of this is done if in the interest of power, money, and the adults. But how's that? And if how's you, that? How's that fair? When when we just said that the reason tenure exists is to protect the yeah to protect the professors. What does it do for the student? So let me no, let me tell you no what, to I'll, protect the professors so that they can so they can talk about anything that they want to talk about. That's how it, that's what it does for the students. But that but presumption is that letting professors talk about whatever they want to talk about is good for students. But when you look at the research on learning and how the human brain functions and how human beings learn, human beings learn by being in groups and solving problems together. But that has so nothing people, to do with it. That's not the discussion. The discussion no, is... But yeah, no, but it, but it does have something to do with it because the biggest barrier to changing the way that we educate at the university level, whether it's with your transfer porthole. I like when you call it a porthole, by the way, instead of a portal. I know. I just, I don't know why I say that. I think it's a New Yorker in me, but it's portal. It takes on a, a nautical vibe. I know, like, I know. I, I, I realize that. I didn't mean to say it. I, I, I But I, I like it. it. I find it... I find it charming because the transfer portal kind of sounds like a Star Trek or a Star Wars thing, like I know. intergalactic. But the transfer porthole is like a location on the boat. I know, where you gotta, I know. I caught myself. You got to try to crawl through the window if you. If I hope you didn't have too big lunch because you're gonna have to squeeze through the portal if you want to get another job. Uh, anyway, I couldn't help myself. The, my point is <laughs> that the whole system, the tra the tenure system, et cetera, et cetera. The reason we are not getting the learning that we could be getting is because we are not delivering the expertise that exists to the largest number of people. And we are not putting people, the students in environments where they're the most likely to learn. So the question is, is tenure an asset to the educational experience or a liability to the educational experience? And my bottom line is I believe tenure is a liability to the educational experience. I believe it is a well-intended and admirable concept in the scope of, of Socrates and the Greek scholars of Athens, where any idea should be, there's no idea that should get you thrown out of the Colosseum. The point of the educational Colosseum is that there is no idea that can get you thrown out. But what has, but I believe that tenure has been manipulated maybe not even consciously or explicitly, but implicitly and unconsciously as a means to preserve power, not as a means to empower thought. And I think that that's very common with every organization, that the reason that you and I are, so, you are so attracted to a more raw capitalistic environment, or I forget when I say capitalistic, but a raw market economy, let's say, with good information is because it is so ruthless in shifting its loyalties to the next most efficient answer to the problem without the sacred cows or the ability to gatekeep a la an Apple monopoly for its, its uh, app store or whether it's, um, I forget what we were talking about the other day, but you didn't like it. There was something that you wanted to get rid of the other day. I can't remember, but you had some government intervention you were recommending on something. Oh, it was, um, compensation it was the uh what was it the the uh non non competes you don't want to get rid of the non competes yeah i know and i think that the, that the, and that the tenure has been bastardized as a mechanism to preserve power and limit new ideas and limit the marketplace of ideas okay well but i believe go ahead finish up no no i think that at, at its best tenure if in a honorable world of brilliant scholars tenure would be fabulous to empower outrageous and provocative thought in order to cause people to recontextualize themselves in the world but reality is tenure has been used as a means to reduce the marketplace of ideas and preserve and, and for people to keep their job 
So, well, but which is not to say that my point is that it's not to say that you should necessarily throw out tenure, but you need to find a way to better accomplish the ideal of an open form of ideas because tenure is not getting it done. Okay. I'm surprisingly, I'm going to, in general principle, agree with you because, uh, you know, because it's very easy to agree. I find it interesting that you were opposed to student athletes being able to jump around, but for some reason, you have no issue with that when it comes to professors. But, but I understand you're looking for an alternative. I, as a free market kind of junkie, I, that's my issue with it in that, first of all, I don't think you have to get rid of 80% of your professors or teachers or anything. I think that's all the, no, no, but the whole university shut them all. I'm, okay. them into I think that that's just, you're just, you're just, you're just trying to, you know, scare the children. But um, what I do think is that it is very difficult for universities. Like, like I, I'm going to, I hate to keep going back to sports, but I think I have to. In the sports world, it is possible through draft picks and through trades and through free agency that you can build a team. In the world of academia, it is virtually impossible because of the nature of academia that you can restructure the a university based on their reputation and rankings and things like that. So we have is we have this archaic system um, where, you know, if you were to get tenure at one of the really good schools in this country, you will never leave because that is that is that is as prestigious as it can get. That is the award that you get for being whoever it is that you are, that you got offered that position. And therefore, the rankings never change. The ratings, the rankings, the the nothing ever changes. You know, in a true in, in the system that I would love to see to make higher education actually work at a, at a, at a completely different level to make us the, I, I guess, you know, the global leader in this to, is to maximize our potential to maximize our potential is to allow schools to go out. And rather than, rather than pay $10 million a year for a head football coach, you know, which is which is what they can do now because they make money from you know football players and things like that. But rather than have all the emphasis on sports, to bring some of the emphasis on academics, to bring in, for example, a Nobel Prize winner, an ex chairman of the Fed, an ex. Why not let that person work off of? Why not scale that professor? My point is scale that professor. Don't just go from one university to the other. That Nobel professor make them available to as many students. Well, as possible. I, I understand what you're saying because you want to do that all virtually and everything else. But I'm talking about kind of more of an in person thing. We're not going, okay, okay. not going the whole virtual digital route yet. All right, but okay, but on a on a certain level, there's no reason why the University of Nebraska, okay, can't compete with Princeton. In, this is what I'm saying, and there's no reason can't bid for some Princeton Nobels and bring them over. That's right. That's right. And there's no but reason the why. Nobel, but, the, but the tenured Princeton professor will never go to Nebraska. Well, they won't now because there is no reason to do that. You and there's a lot into, of reasons not to. Well, but, but a football coach will go from Princeton to Nebraska. No problem. No problem. They would prefer it. Okay. Don't, you, you, hear, you, you understand my point. So if a football yeah, coach. I do. If a football coach will go from Princeton to Nebraska, then a Nobel Prize winner should go from Princeton to Nebraska too, under the right set of circumstances. Okay, and and that's what you, we need to create. I agree with you, but again, now we're so you so, but you're dismissing my fantasy educational system in favor of your fantasy educational system. But both of us are circumventing the actual educational system, which is a system based on the sale of prestige. So the big mistake is the universities do not sell education. The universities sell social prestige, social status, and social access. The reason Princeton is better than Nebraska is not because the education 
the math class is better, although it may be at Princeton. It's because the, so the access and the social status and the nature of the internships and the students and the cultural capital and the fathers and mothers of the other students and who's a bank CEO and who's a whatever, whatever, that it is a social differentiation. It is not an educational. No, that, that's not. That's that's only partially true. It is an educational thing. There are there are certain if you have if you have Nobel Prize winners I, that are teaching. I agree. I agree. I'm not disagreeing with, but I'm saying that's not the reason people make the choice. No, of course that, 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 not. I of course not. There's a lot of reasons, but I'm, well, all I'm saying is, let's there. There's a couple things you have to do if you want to address tenure. And one of the things you have to do is put protections in place so that professors and teachers, so so that they, first of all, to protect um, to protect their freedom of thought and their freedom to be imaginative and creative and to talk about things that that you know that that may be controversial or unpopular or controversial or that may be unpopular or that may be controversial or that may piss a few people off. Or a certain, you know, group, religion, Even whatever. Even a lot of people. Yeah, that's fine. And you have to protect them. And and that, that that is, at a very minimum, that's what you have to do. But on top of that, as long as we can put those protections in place, which was kind of the, the foundation of tenure to start with, once those protections are in place, then we can create a system where a professor will not mind being at some university for three years and then some other place for the next five years and let let teachers have an opportunity to let's create an environment where teachers based on and professors based on what they are teaching and what people get out of those classes generate revenue for those universities that in turn generate a certain student that becomes much more valuable in the workplace. I mean, right now you can almost tell what you're going if to you get. If you want to create a valuable student, you would have to have to have them learn things. That's right. And in order for someone to learn things, they need to be in a group-based problem-solving well, environment. In, in, in order for if people they don't need- to learn things, you have to create an environment that encourages the smartest people and the best people to be those teachers. One of the reasons that that not and you everybody need those best and smart teachers to be accessible to the largest number of students. That's a that's a different discussion, but I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing with you, but that's a different discussion. There is there's a certain amount of value of the in-person class compared to everything online. Of everything course. online to me is not is not the total solution. It's a complementary solution, and I know it from what we oh. do here at Tasty. Our in-person events are far more valuable than our online events. It's just something special about it. And I don't think anybody should should have to go through higher education or any kind of education and not get to experience that. So I think that's a really important part. But I think we can make it so much better by encouraging, by creating kind of a free market. And one of the ways you get into a free market is essentially you change what has always been kind of the legacy tenure platform. And so... Let's set aside all the words and let's let us reduce this that to that which we agree. Having protections for teachers to have controversial thoughts and ideas is a good thing. Tenure was intended to do that, but has failed. And it has been converted actually into a limitation of ideas and a limitation of opportunity. Do you agree or you do not agree? I agree. And so the solution is, so let's say, that, as you know, with any star system, 1% of the participants, whether it's 1% of the college football players, 1% of the college basketball players, 1% of the traders, whatever it is, the 1% of the movie stars get 99% of the money. It's not a, It's not an incrementally smooth curve and so the issue would be one percent of the professors would be the ones that would be going through the transfer porthole from nebraska to to princeton 
and and none, the rest of the progressives wouldn't change. I think that the biggest is the reason people like I'm sure the reason that the people who watch Tasty said, what would you talk about tenure is the f- the fundamental concern is that tenure has created a very limited scope of thought in the on university <coughs> campuses. Not an expanded one. And that it has made it very difficult to change who's in charge of teaching at these universities. And so I think that the question, when somebody asks me about what my opinion of tenure is, the way I interpret that question is, do I believe that universities are fulfilling their aspiration to be a place of free and open thought and discussion? And do I think that professors are helping to expand free, open thought and discussion? And I don't. I think that universities are limiting thought and discussion and limiting the opportunity. I mean, I had an, as you know, I'm on the board of this biotechnology company, which is at a university, which I shall not, which is partial part of a university, which I shall not name. And there was a mandate for a position for a minority research assistant with a budget. And so the company that I work for identified a very well-qualified Asian-American male from India who, who was a minority. And we were told that we could not hire him because he was not the correct minority. Because it was he wasn't min- minority enough. So then we had to file an appeal because it was a dispute between the state rules on what a minority is and what the federal government rules on what a minority is. And ultimately we won the appeal because while there may be degrees of minority in somebody's head, at the federal government level, a minority has a legal definition. It's not a subjective definition. But I interpreted that as an example of a university using its incumbent tenured power to to restrict the scope of opportunity to that which they approved of, which I think is the primary issue that that many people in this country have regarding the universities in general. The question that matters from a market perspective is, are we creating crops of 22 year olds plus or minus about four years either way that are increasingly interested capable and engaged in participating in the economy as it is structured right now and i'm not sure that we are and and i and i think so the big question is how do you help the universities create a more robust set of graduates every year as opposed to an increasingly or a or a less robust pool of graduates every year and is tenure a pro- like do you believe that we're creating better or worse graduates every year at this point in your opinion i believe with the with the with with the way tech with the speed at which technology um continues to um continues to be rolled out we are creating better and better graduates every year. And do you believe that's a function of the educational system itself, or that's the function of technology bypa- bypassing or augmenting the educational system and the actual nature of? No, there's no brain such brain. thing. There's no such thing as bypassing education. Everything is a derivative of the educational system. So there is nothing. We have nothing without our educational system. Um, so no, I'm not buying that argument at all. The, 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 everything is a, you know, like I said, a byproduct or a derivative of our educational system. Our educational system keeps getting better. And one of the reasons that the economy grows at the pace that it does, one of the reasons that, um, that valuations grow at the way that they have over the last couple of decades is because education keeps getting better and better in spite of what everybody says and thinks and blah, blah, blah. That's not what's actually happening. What's actually happening is, you know, education works, college works, 
the maturation really? process through the whole thing, it works. I understand the debt issues. I understand the tenure issues. I understand all that. But in spite of all that stuff, the system works. And the kids that are coming out of school today are, and you know. why is the participation rate falling off so rapidly? What participation and, and rate? En enrollment in university, especially from young men. It's expensive. And Maybe it would be less expensive without tenure, without paying a bunch of professors that you can't fire to not work. I, I don't disagree with you, which is why I made this argument in the first place. That's why I said, make it into a free market and make the market, depending on kind of what's being taught, there's all this interest. You know, it's it's like I said, it should just be like sports where it's free. You know, it's essentially, it's it's a true free market. But I don't, I'm not going to indict the whole, you know, um, uh, educational system. I think that's ridiculous. One of the reasons we are where we are today is because of how good and and how we prepare people, whether it's through networking, internships, the classes that are taught today, today's technology, all the money that's spent on infrastructure in education. I mean, let, let's not discount. Don't don't buy into all the negative, you know, all the dummies and negative, crazy press that that's you know that that's trying to paint a different picture. That's not what it's like. As somebody that hires a lot of young kids, they're better today than they were 10 years ago. They're better 10 years ago than they were 10 years before that. Period. They're and smarter. What, what, just a, what, what's better about them? Uh, they're, they're in, there's just a, I think that the access to information has made people, they know more. Everybody knows more. There's very little one dimension. I, I don't disagree with. That. I'm sure they know more. I just everybody used to be very one dimensional, myself included. We were very one dimensional. We didn't have access to that much information. And today, you we think, have access I, I, I don't disagree with that at all. But you think the reason they know more is because of the educational system? Well, I think that you know one of the reasons I'm such a proponent of it is because that there's a maturation process where your brain starts to you know there's a certain part of your life where you I know, agree with that where you're just screwing around and then you end up going to college and you're kind of learning how to de-screw around and then also learn something. So the, so the primary value of university is a socialization process, yeah, not that, an education exactly. process. It, it is a big part of it. It's a network. And we and are- And it's also, like you said, how to be a, a, a young man or a young woman yeah. as opposed to a teenage uh, overgrown child. Yeah, yeah. And it teaches you it's essentially the world's greatest network. And, and that's where we start to learn. You know, that's where we make our connections. That's where we, you know, start to branch. That, it's, it's where you kind of grow up. And that's what's so important about it. Well, that's why people, I, it kills me when people go, well, it's not worth it. I'm like, what's not worth it? You know, don't say it's not worth it because that's ridiculous. You can't afford not to do it. A setting aside your fantasy transfer portal. Setting aside my fantasy global digital all stars university with meetups and keeping the current university structure as it stands today, would you, if you had the authority to either, as Julius Caesar, to either keep tenure or end tenure, what would you do and why? You cannot end tenure without ensuring that the protections that the protections that tenure affords professors and teachers is kept in place you have to have that you know you cannot all of a sudden so can i speak to that briefly yeah so much like with the non-compete which you made very clear and I, I agree with you ultimately is not necessary to protect trade secrets for instance so I can't take all the my trade secrets of my time at Tasty and go sell them to Robinhood, even if I don't have a non-compete or interactive brokers or whoever, because there's other legal means to enforce protection on a company's trade secrets. Could you not suspend or end tenure, but have a employment contract that states that an individual cannot be terminated for anything that they've said or written. 
I mean, if we had that in place, I would be okay with, you know, changing the game. Basically, you'd use the trade secrets protection as opposed sure. to the non-compete so that you eliminate the calci because the non-compete is another version of a calcified system, right? Where it's a it's a it's a it's used for purposes of power and control, not for purposes of creativity and efficiency. That's right. Tenure tenure is used now for power and control, but it hides behind the excuse of being a necessary protection for free freedom of thought and speech. I I would love to see the the world of professors be really open to a, a true free market, and I would love to see people go from one university to another, um, like they can in business, like they can in real estate. I, I would love to have the transfer portal be be available to businesses, for CEOs, for, you know, for for anybody that in management, because that would create this, this absolutely, you know, uh, it would be just so interesting to me in the world of business. It would change everything. Like it literally would change everything almost overnight. But once a year, the transfer portal opens and you can look at all the managers at all the other brokers, see which well, ones you like. I mean, you basically, you can basically find out your value in instantaneously. Like people don't know what they're worth. And, um, and that would just be so freaking fascinating. Do you think there's a, again, this is a sort of, I guess this is a bit of a philosophical question. I don't know if it's worth asking, but again, it's easy to quantify the value of a, of a, of a hard science professor that's, you know, a computer science professor at MIT that's teaching computer science to MIT graduates that are going to work at Google is a very linear sort of um, type of professor to evaluate. A philosophy professor who may be utterly brilliant at the University of Nebraska as a teacher, but who's specializing in enrolling young minds in the very idea that there are people, whether it was Kant or John Locke or Nietzsche or all these philosophers, and the sort of the way that they even reflected upon the very meaning of existence and all the all the jibber jabber, which may be extraordinarily valuable to a person's life and making decisions and making peace with various outcomes in their life and helping other people and all these things, but it's much less concrete. I guess my point is not everything has a dollar value, but it, just because something lacks a dollar, the problem with a market worldview is it reduces everything to the dollars associated with the value of the item. And there are things in society, particularly in education, but also in places like healthcare, where there, there are, are things that have substantial value, even if they don't have an apparent economic value. That's fair. And tenure, I think, and this is just, tenure is intended to also protect that aspect. Where that, like if I, if I teach you crypto trading in the middle of a crypto boom, I can very explicitly be like, was it I teach you these things? You're going to make more money. So pay me more money because I'm teaching you something that helps you make money. Anyway, I just think that that's, that's a different discussion. That's a different truth or skepticism for a different day. But the primary issue with market reductionism for, all, for, for the solving of all problems is it assigns a value of zero to things that are extraordinarily value, valuable particularly things that exist in the healthcare and the educational system. And I think that the risk of reducing a, to education to a marketplace, unlike the CEO world or unlike the entertainment world or unlike the you know trading world or the athletic world, is the educational world occupies a space that's more akin to the healthcare world where it has a value proposition that's not, a, that's not really captured by dollars in a linear sense. Really fascinating. So thanks so much for spending your uh, Wednesday afternoon with us for the last uh, 40 minutes or so. And we'll be back with Truth or Skepticism uh, next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Um, we'll see you soon. Thanks so much.